Well, it's good to be here tonight. My name is Stetson Plank. I'm here with my family, my wife Sandy, and our son Isaiah. Last time we were here, Pearl is in with the kids class. Last time we were here, Isaiah was uh, much smaller. I think he was, what, probably five, maybe, when we came through here. And uh, Pearl was just a baby. Uh, but we are glad to be back. Um, I'll show a quick video. We'll see um, uh, about getting that up here, and then uh, I'll bring a devotion. Close my eyes, I see Verona. The Roman ruins, the cobblestone streets, the frescoed buildings, the espresso machines, the scooters, the river Adige outlining the old part of the city. But most of all, I see the people. I see the grandmothers keeping watch over their neighborhood from their balconies. I see the animated conversation, or sometimes more said with hand gestures than words. I see kids playing soccer wherever there's space to kick a ball. I see them admiring food like it's a work of art. I see their lack of understanding of the words, personal space. And I see the many Italians that adopted my family as their own. But behind the light-filled landscapes, unforgettable meals, breathtaking art, expressive language, and religious facade is a country blinded to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. A country consumed with the present, avoiding the reality of future divine judgment. Do you see Italy as a country in desperate need of the gospel? I do. Do you see the Italian people enslaved to the dead works and tradition of Catholicism? I do. Italy is a country filled with relics, the supposed tombs of the apostles, a piece of the cross, Peter's prison chains, and a number of other counterfeits in an attempt to authenticate the Catholic Church's claims to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Every town, big or small, honors their patron saint in their respective day. Crucifixes can be found in post offices, public schools, grocery stores, and doctor's offices. In every community, people genuflect and worship before statues of Mary. But the hardness of Italians to the gospel is more nuanced than just the false teachings of Catholicism. True, they're shackled by a religion based on reaching God through self-effort, but many Italians are blinded as well by the notion that since Christ died for all, then everyone in the world is already saved. Other Italians claim no religion is 100% true and a person's faith is just a cultural interpretation of who God is. Still others are consumed with materialism or indifferently agnostic. There's no concern for their own souls, no concern about eternity, no fear of hell. Many Italians don't even believe there is a hell. Many years ago, I knew the Lord was calling, follow me, preach the gospel in Italy, reach Italian souls for Christ. And so we went by faith. We ministered in Italy for nearly a decade, saw Italians saved and discipled. And then for a brief season in 2020, the Lord brought us back to the States. He's now repeated the call, follow me, preach the gospel in Italy, return to Verona. By faith, we return. Will you share our burden for Italy? We're burdened that Italians hear how God saves sinners who are too broken to save themselves through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our city of Verona in the Veneto region of Italy has a population of over 260,000 souls and is ranked second among the cities of over 100,000 with the fewest established gospel preaching churches. The Veneto region itself approaches five million souls and is one of the least reached areas of Italy. To us, this is more than just statistics and random faces seen in a video. They are people that we know personally, people that are lost and on their way to hell, people that need Christ. Italians who we've led to the Lord and discipled are awaiting our return as well. We've continued to minister to them while in the States with Bible studies through Skype. 
which given the lockdowns in Italy due to COVID over the past year, is the same way we would have had to meet even if we were in Italian soil. They're waiting on us to return to Verona to establish a local Baptist church. Il pastore stesso mi ha riavvicinato alla fede in Gesù Cristo e mi chiedo alla vostra comunità di inviarlo nuovamente in Italia per continuare il suo lavoro. Grazie mille. Ciao, mi chiamo Nicola. Ho conosciuto il pastore Stezzo e la sua famiglia una decina d'anni fa quando sono arrivati a Verona. Insieme al pastore Stezzo ho imparato a leggere la Bibbia e a conoscere Gesù. Non l'avevo mai fatto prima e la cosa mi rende molto felice. Quindi vi chiedo se potete di farlo tornare qui in Italia, a Verona, per poter continuare il progetto della costruzione della sua chiesa e insieme a noi. Grazie. Pace a tutti. Ho conosciuto il pastore Stetson e con lui ho approfondito la parola di Dio e sono cresciuta spiritualmente. Dove vivo non c'è una chiesa evangelica. So che il pastore desidera venire in Italia per aprire una chiesa. Vi chiedo di aiutare il pastore Stetson con un sostegno economico affinché lui possa fare questo viaggio per l'Italia e iniziare questa nuova opera. Grazie a tutti, Dio vi benedica. Pace, vi chiedo di poter aiutare il pastore Stetson a tornare in Italia. Per noi giovani sarà una grande gioia avere una chiesa dove poter crescere spiritualmente. Pace del Signore, vi chiedo di poter aiutare e sostenere il pastore Stetson a tornare in Italia. Insieme abbiamo studiato e approfondito le scritture in modo davvero molto edificante. Credo che il Signore abbia per lui e per il pastore un'opera per la sua gloria qui in Italia. Vi chiedo quindi di poterlo sostenere. Grazie, che Dio lo benedica. I am Pastor Jerry Seiler, Cornerstone Baptist Temple. We're the sending church of the Plank family. We're sure delighted that they're returning back to Italy. They're very fluent in the language. They've proven they have a great heart for the Italian people. The Italian people need them. And so we would ask that you would join with us and support them as they make this move to get back to the Italian people to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. With the support of our home church and churches like yours with a heart for missions, we can return to Italy and reach Italian souls for Christ. Will you help us? Verona is in desperate need of the gospel. Um, just thought I'd talk just a little bit about uh, what God's been doing in our life. Um, if you could ask the Lord any question, what would you ask him? If you could ask him any personal question, I should say. If he was sitting across the table from you, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, there's a lot of questions that I'm sure that we could, we could ask him like that. Doctrinal questions, like having him explain Romans chapter 9, or um, curiosities, like what the forbidden fruit tasted like. Um, I know I had a question for him. I had a question for him, and uh, I prayed months about this question. And he answered me. He answered me through his book. I'm glad that God still speaks through his word, amen? Uh, let me just kind of go back before we get to that question that I had for the Lord. Uh, we left Rome, we started in Rome. In fact, uh, Pastor Carpenter and uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Carpenter came to, Chris, came to see us uh, in Rome many years ago. And at that time, we were praying about where the Lord would have us to go to start our ministry. We started in Rome, learning the language, and uh, I was praying about where the Lord would have us go. We visited several different cities, and we went to the north, uh, to the city of Verona, and uh, 
we walked around the city. There's uh, usually in Italy, there's the ancient part of a city in medieval, um, built in the dark ages, and then you go out into more modern areas. And as we was walking down into the city center, uh, there's the medieval wall around Verona, and uh, on the, the wall is a plaque. Anybody know what Verona's famous for? You ever heard of Verona? Romeo and Juliet, Fair Verona, where we lay our scene. Shakespeare set his play, Romeo and Juliet, in the city of Verona. And there's a plaque on the wall uh, where Romeo, it's a quote from Romeo that says, basically, there is no world outside of Verona walls. He was about to be banished to Mantova. And so that plaque commemorates that statement in the play. And uh, Sandy and I stopped, and we was talking before, uh, in front of that plaque, talking about the walls of Verona. And we go back to the hotel that night or the bed and breakfast, and I was praying for the peace of the Lord as to where he would have us to start us, uh, establish a church. I said, Lord, I know that in your word you don't mention Verona. There are a few places you mention Italy. We're in Italy, but I want you to speak to me as to whether or not this is where you want us to start a church, if this is where you want us to begin to minister, but I don't know how you're going to do it. So I just opened up the word of God and I began to pray for peace. And I was praying for peace and opened up to Psalm 120 and uh, just continued to pray for peace. The Lord, there was nothing there that really spoke to me. Psalm 121, again, I'm praying for peace, nothing there that spoke to me. Got to Psalm 122 down in verse 7 and the Bible says, peace be within thy walls. Now we had just been talking about the walls of Rona and the Holy Spirit really use that verse. The context is the walls of Jerusalem, but the Holy Spirit used that verse to impress upon my heart that's where we should minister. And that's what we did for many years. Uh, we were in Verona for, I think, about six years. We were in Rome for several years before that, two and a half, almost three years in Rome. And um, so we began to minister in, in, uh, in Verona, very hard into the gospel, um, saw some people saved, it's more of a marathon than a sprint there in terms of ministry, discipled, and we were about to start a church in 2020. And in fact, we prayed in 2020, uh, Lord, uh, I got up and, and, and I told Sandy, I said, I, I believe God's going to do something big this year. And uh, we weren't quite expecting what all was going to happen in 2020, obviously, <laughs> Uh, major changes happened in our lives, uh, but one of those changes um, beyond COVID was the fact that the Lord brought us back to the States. The Lord brought us back to the States. I believe that with all my heart. There was a reason for that, but the question, fast forwarding to when I began to speak tonight, uh, the question that I had to the Lord was, why did you take us to Norway? I didn't understand that. Again, you have a question for the Lord. I believe he'll answer you through this book. And I sat for about December through January. I'd pray, and I was asking the Lord that question, why he would take us from Italy. And I got to verse 15 of Philemon, and the context is Onesimus, the runaway slave. But the Lord spoke to me and answered my question in Philemon, verse 15. And I read, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. And the Holy Spirit used that verse to smite my heart and speak very clearly. Stetson, you departed Italy for a season. You've been asking me why. Why would I take you from Italy? There were some things he wanted us to accomplish here in the States. And uh, he brought us back for a season that the Italian people might receive us forever. And we are so excited to get back to Italy. Those were just a few of the faces that we've ministered to, a few of the people that we've ministered, ministered to in Italy. They are waiting for us to establish a church. We've continued Bible studies with them. Um, and uh, we are excited to get back to Italy. Uh, Friendship Baptist had supported us for many, many years. And uh, we have appreciated that. And we are looking forward to getting back and ministering to the Italian people. Before I give a, uh, a quick devotion tonight, uh, I believe the Lord did an audible on me. And so we're going to actually bring a lesson tonight from Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, but uh, what we read in Romans was certainly very important to read. Uh, a good portion of scripture. 
But uh, we'll go to Romans chapter 1, verse 9. But before we begin tonight, I wonder, does anybody have any questions about Italy, about our ministry, about my family, anything whatsoever? Any questions? Yes. What is the Italian flag? Uh, it's actually out on our table, a display in the lobby, and it is uh, green, white, and red. And I one time, I, I said, do you remember what those colors stand for? I, uh, I used to know that, but I don't remember why they chose those colors, but there is a significance that they apply to each one of those colors. But it's just this green, white, and red flag. I used to love flags. Any other questions? You anxious for the devotion? Is that it? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Um, we'll be at our table. If you would uh, happen to have any questions, we would love to, to talk with you. Uh, but for the brief moment that we have tonight, I'd like us to look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, the background on the book of Joshua, Joshua is a book of new beginnings. And uh, new beginnings for the people of God after 40 years in the wilderness. Israel claimed their inheritance. They're about to enter into the promised land. And from Exodus chapter 3 to Deuteronomy chapter 34, the emphasis is on the ministry of Moses. And uh, he was God's chosen servant to lead the nation. However, Moses dies and uh, a new servant of the Lord would lead God's people. And his name was Joshua. Joshua experienced a lot of changes in his life. He experienced a changed name. Uh, we learn from Numbers chapter 13, verse 8, that his given name was Oshia, but Moses changed it to Joshua in Numbers 13, 16, which means Jehovah is salvation. Uh, he had a changed position from Moses' servant to Moses' successor. He had a changed land. He was born a slave in Egypt. And now he's leading the promised, uh, leading the people of God into the promised land. So Joshua was experiencing many changes in his life. Let me ask you a question. How do you handle change? How do you handle changes in your life? Is it easy? Is it stressful? Um, there are many changes that happen. Life is all about changes, and, and certainly they can be stressful. In fact, in the 1960s, there was two psychologists that studied how various life changes, especially when they're coupled together, can create stress in a person's life where it affects your health. And uh, some of these changes, there was 43, and they graded them, and and as these were clustered together, they had um, varying degrees of effect on a person's health. Some of these included death of a close family member, especially a spouse, divorce, personal injury or illness, uh, health issues, fired up, being fired from work, a change in financial state, a change to a different line of work, taking on a mortgage, beginning or ending school, changing in living conditions, changing in working hours. Have I, have I hit yours yet? Uh, In-law troubles. Now have I hit yours yet? Um, changes to a new, new school, changes in church activities, changes in social activities, changes in sleeping habits, changes in eating habits. All of these things are stresses that we experience in our life. How do you handle change? How do you handle Stress. Joshua had to deal with the death of Moses and then be responsible for leading a nation of over 600,000 men into the promised land. Talk about stress. And with that, we find in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, the Lord commanding Joshua with these words. Joshua 1, 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Let me just pause here. Why did he have to tell Joshua that? I would submit to you because Joshua was afraid and maybe feeling overwhelmed. The Lord commands him. 
in the midst of this stress, in the midst of this trial, in the midst of these difficulties, Joshua, I know that you're scared. I know that you feel overwhelmed. But do not be afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So I'd like us to look at three things this evening on how to deal with change. And the title of the message tonight is An Unchanging God in the Midst of Changing Times. An Unchanging God in the Midst of Changing Times. How do we deal with change? Number one, how do we deal with change? We praise God. We praise God. We praise God because He is unchanging. Look again at this verse. Who's doing the commanding? Have not I commanded thee? I like us for all three points. We're staying in uh, verse 9 here, and we just want to emphasize a different point in each uh, of these uh, three uh, uh, points that the Lord would have us look at tonight. Number one is, is we praise God because he's changing. He is the one doing the commanding. For the Lord thy God is with thee. Let's look. Uh, Hold your hand in Joshua, and uh, let's go to Psalm chapter 61. Psalm 61, and we'll read verses 1 through 4 and verse 8. Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4 and verse 8. David, the psalmist, writes, Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. You think David was handling change or facing changes? David was feeling overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. Look at verse 8. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Even though David, do you feel overwhelmed? Hey, at some point in life, we will be put in a situation where we find no answers, where Even our friends maybe forsake us or we feel alone and we feel like we're out in the midst of the sea with the waves crashing in all around us and we feel overwhelmed. And in the midst of that, as David was here, he says, even in the midst when my heart is overwhelmed, verse 8, I will sing praise unto thy name forever. Now that's... That's easy preaching and hard living, right? When you're in the midst of the valley, when you're going through the difficulties, when you're facing change, when you're going through trials, when your heart is heavy, can we say with David, I will praise God. Why is it that we can do that? In the midst of change, why can we praise God? One, because he's unchanging in his nature. And two, because he's unchanging in his promises. I am so thankful, and we can praise God. Uh, We don't have time, but if you look in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, Two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. Two unchangeable things. And as you read Hebrews chapter 6, you'll find that those two things, as I mentioned, are God's nature and God's promises. Now, if you think of the essence of God, uh, who God is, you know these, uh, uh, these wagon wheels uh, that uh, you know, they used on the covered wagons as they would go out west, and it's a big wheel, uh, wheel, and then you have the spokes coming inward to a hub. If you think of the nature of God, now this isn't a perfect illustration, but if you think of the nature of God, each one of those spokes representing a different attribute of God. God is holy. God is love. God is just. God is wise. God is eternal. 
God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God is uh, omnipotent. And on, all of those spokes meet at the hub. That hub would be the immutability of God, the fact that God does not change. Because if his wisdom could be obscured or become more profound, if his, if his power could weaken or grow stronger, if his holiness could be tainted or become more pure, if his goodness could be corrupted or become more good, if his knowledge could diminish or grow, then God would not be God. Because in all change, there's a change from which something goes to which it arrives. Now, if God changed for the better, then he was not perfect before. And if he changed for the worse, then he's no longer perfect. But praise God, God does not change. God is immutable. What does that have to do with our situation, with the troubles in our life? Well, he's not like pagan gods. He's not arbitrary. He's not capricious. He's not impulsive. He's not vindictive. He's not like Zeus with a thunderbolt just waiting for you to mess up. He's not a chameleon. Many people, are uh, they change who they are depending upon uh, who they're with. That's not God. You cannot catch God on a bad day. Aren't you glad that there is no problem that you can go to God with that surprises Him? That God is unchanging. So in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your tribulation, in the midst of your difficulty, we can praise God because He is unchanging at His very core in who He is. Not only do we praise Him because of His unchanging nature, but we praise Him for His promises. The Bible tells us God cannot lie. What God says, God will perform. Now, humans being human, how many times do we make promises to somebody and we have every intention upon keeping them, but then we run out of money or something an emergency happens where we can't fulfill that which we've said that we would do. Not that we're lying, but that we have every intention to do what we said that we would do, but the unforeseen happens and we cannot fulfill what we've promised we could do. That's not God. What God promises, He will perform. So in the midst of our trials, we can praise God. How do you handle change? How do you handle change in changing times? Praise God that He is unchanging. Praise God He's unchanging in His nature, and praise God that He is unchanging in His promises. How else do we deal with change? One, praise God, but then we also trust God. Not only do we praise God, but we trust God. Go back to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Knowing who God is in his very nature, we can trust that whatever dark valley that we go down, the Lord is with us. Even when we feel, if God withdraws himself in the sense that his presence is not as manifest to us, we can be just as sure that God is near. That, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We can trust God. Now, to contrast our trust of God with, with man, um, consider how much man changes. The history of man is one of change. Uh, you find it in the doctrines that people hold to. Paul wrote this, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, people were changing their doctrine. Israel wavered from God to idols. Lot's wife looked back at Sodom. King Saul, you find him promising not to persecute David, and then he turns around and he's trying to persecute David. 
Pharaoh, how many times did he promise to let Israel go and then backtrack? How many times did Peter, Peter vow never to forsake Christ? And before the cock crows three times, Peter is denying the Lord three times. Nebuchadnezzar was so affected by Daniel's dream that he said, Daniel's God is the only God, and then you find him uh, lifting up a statue of himself for everybody to bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Man is all about change. Think about in our own lives. How many times do we wake up and promise the Lord, today I'm going to live for you, and by the end of the night when we pillar our head, how could I have done that? How could I do that? We let people down. Uh, We don't follow through. In fact, the passage that we read uh, today from Matthew uh, chapter 7, Paul says basically, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Why? Because we have this sin nature within us. That's all about change. The wise man said in Proverbs 25, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. A person cannot eat well with a broken tooth. He cannot walk well with a broken foot. Both let the person down painfully at a point of need. Um, Often this can be the case as we put our trust with people, but that's not what happens when we put our trust in God. The same God that we Fall upon broken for salvation, and he never fails. Those that call upon him, you will surely be saved. Praise God. That's the promise of God. In the same way as we fall upon God in the brokenness of our spirit, as life crushes us, we can trust that same almighty God to lift us up and to be with us. Amen? Man might fail, but God will never fail. How do we deal with changing times? We trust an unchanging God. We praise an unchanging God. And lastly, we choose an unchanging God. How do you deal with change? A lot of people put their trust in money. The market changes. A lot of people put their trust in men. We've seen how that goes. But we can trust in God. Who is doing the promising here to Joshua? Have not I commanded thee? We have a choice of how we deal with change. We have a choice who we're going to serve. And we find Joshua's choice at the end of the book, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Joshua says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Choose you this day whom you will serve. Last part of that verse. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have a choice with every trial you face. To give in to the flesh, to give in to the pressure, to give in to the despair or to choose to trust the Lord. Now, I'm not belittling anyone that suffers with depression. I'm not belittling anyone that suffers with with just anxiety and and, and these things that just it, it just, it seems like things are too overwhelming. But I would hope to encourage you tonight that in the midst of the changes of life as they come, We can praise God that he's unchanging. We can trust God that he's unchanging. And we should choose God because he's unchanging. Amen. If everybody will bow their head and and close their eyes, we'll just have a moment of prayer before I I turn uh, the service back over. But I wonder tonight, I would be remiss if I did not ask you, The biggest change that you can make is to pass from death to life. I I don't know who might be here today, but if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you've never chose God 
for that chain. I wonder if you would raise your hand so I might pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. But if there's been a moment that you have never trusted Christ, you say, yes, Brother Stetson, I know that I'm a sinner. We know we're a sinner. Why? Because of the sins. Nobody had to teach us to lie. Nobody had to teach us to rebel or disobey our parents. That's the sin nature within us. We're born sinners. The penalty of that sin, just like if if we were to steal or, or break man's laws, we would stand before a just judge that would condemn us. We have broken God's holy laws and we must stand before a holy judge and we stand guilty, the Bible says, for all have sinned. But praise God, Jesus Christ died for you. He took your place. He took your punishment. He rose from the dead, proving he's God, and you can trust him today if you've never done so and pass from death to life and have the greatest change that affects your eternity. Christian, for you today, I don't know what changes you might be experiencing what difficulties you might be facing. But I just want to encourage you tonight. Think upon who the Lord is and praise Him that He's unchangeable. Trust Him even when you don't know the next step you're going to take. Trust Him because He's unchangeable and choose Him every moment of your life because He's unchangeable.